because no, we're going to move on, stay on time. We have a lot of uh, people on, on schedule today. So that was a leadership leadership roundtable, sorry, what I thought gave a, a very good broad discussion of partnership opportunities between agencies and the federal government and opportunities with states and other entities. This panel is actually going to do a deeper dive for the next hour uh, on how we move the needle through those partnerships, in particular with the subcommittee on uh, of uh, Ocean Science and Technology, or the SOST, which actually was talked a little bit about uh, by Deeran and others on the last panel. It's my uh, real pleasure to uh, have the opportunity to moderate this panel and also with uh, distinction, uh, our co-chairs of the SOST, uh, Captain Lindy Bunn and um, Dr. Rick Murray, uh, co-chairing SOST right now. <coughs> uh, I'd also add that we, uh, we are taking questions that have been provided uh, to us, and then we'll moderate this session and have a lively discussion like we just did a few, mo a few for the last hour, actually. Um, let me say a few words about our, our panel, uh, our panelists here. First, Captain Lindy Bunn, as I mentioned, is a uh, co-chair of the uh, SOST. She's a ocean policy ad advisor detailee from the Navy uh, at the Office of Science and Technology Policy, OSTP, in the Executive Office of the President. You have her, um, her uh, bio uh, in front of you, but I just want to touch on that she's had a number of important appointments with the Navy, with the Department of Defense positions overseas, a number of countries. Also served many years covering southeastern waters of the U.S. and the entire East Coast. And her highest degree is a Doctor of Law from the University of New Hampshire. So thank you, Captain Lindy Bunn. And Rick Murray um, is the uh, Division Director, as many of you know, you should know, at the uh, Ocean Science Division at National Science Foundation. He's on a four-year IPA from Boston University. Rick is a geologist. He's had a very strong academic career, and he's, he's broadened into, um, into Washington, D.C. now, leading OCE. And he also is an avid sailor, and I know in a matter of months he's looking forward to just doing that and not working so much at uh, OCE as much as he's enjoyed it, and it's a great position. So let's kick this off, and we'd actually ask uh, Captain Bunn to start with a summary of SOST. Give us an introduction, if you like, on how the SOST came to be, where it lives in the government structure how it functions and some successes, and we'll move on to Rick. Thank you very much. Sure, thank you. Um, I guess I have to figure out how to turn it on. Should be on. There we go. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. The discussion we heard this morning. Just get closer to the mic. Oh, We're being sorry. recorded. <laughs> thank Unless you. you want to be <laughs> off the record. <laughs> um, I'm privileged to be here, and I think I, I hope I kind of epitomize <laughs> the interagency in that various agencies place people in in uh, the OEOP and other places to serve on boards like this and learn from the interagency board as well as learn from their service and take the information both ways. Um, the questions in the discussion this morning lead us right into the Subcommittee on Ocean Science and Technology as a really good case study. They were a little bit all over the place and hopefully we're going to help you navigate a little bit clearer way forward through that. And to start that, I'm going to stick to my notes a little bit here for the intro so that I stay on point also. Um, I would say at the 30,000 uh, foot level, since its establishment in 2004, the SOST has been the lead interagency entity at the federal development coordination facilitation level on high priority ocean science and technology issues. Basically, that's over a decade of experience, and um, so the SOST helps to identify ocean science and technology issues and priorities. They foster and facilitate the ocean s and activities and contribute to federal goals and agency missions in this area, including the collaboration where we help each other with the priorities. With the science being the foundation of the policy, this is really impactful at the placement of the SOST, especially now, as you heard Darren talk a little bit, with technology playing more and more a role from the policy angle as well. The SOST has been enormously valuable in that it's got historic stability um, <coughs> and it's situated in a way to help advance national priorities, basically to coordinate them from the agencies and help advance it by dialogue up and down since we are sort of an entity between the agencies and the Executive Office of the President. Um, first, its structure, uh, its own structure, 
uh, it ha it's flexible, but at this point it has six interagency working groups. Four of them are mandated by Congress. Uh, this gives stability as well as sustainability, and it also gives flexibility because two of them at this point no, don't necessarily have a congressional mandate. Um, there is the uh, harmful algal blooms and hypoxia formed in response to the harmful algal bloom and hypoxia research and control act of 1998 carried for, forward by reauthorizations as you know this develops action plans reports assessments of harmful, harmful algal bloom and hypoxia events in the US it also has reports that come through up through the SOST and end up with community input um, there's also the ocean acidification I'm actually to save time not going to go through each of those there's the integrated ocean observations that you heard some discussion about this morning the ocean and coastal mapping as well. And then without congressional mandate is uh, right now the facilities and infrastructure and education uh, interagency working groups. Further, there are three task forces and these add additional flexibility. Right now we have ocean noise and marine life, sea level rise and social sciences. Um, the committee, the SOST and its IWG task forces are basically designed to formalize a link among 26 different agencies, all who participate um, and all who have different agendas and priorities, and they link with the EOP uh, by executive direction, by law, and historically there's been some degree of state, local, tribal, private, international input. There's been some discussion earlier about how does, how did various input, uh, how is it made known to the EOP, and it's from my observation on the SOST and in OSTP, there's a fairly robust uh, dialogue with industry that comes in and tells us when uh, and talks to us about issues. So you heard some solicitation from Deere and about tell us what the issues are. Um, I would say that, uh, as you know, the SOST also has a dual role for the National Ocean Council uh, to implement the National Ocean Policy and serve as the science and technology arm on that. Um, second, for the sustainability and the success of the SOST is that it's organized under the um, Committee for Environment and Natural Resources, which is under the National Science Technology Council in OSTP. That is basically a cabinet level position and board that uh, serves as um, advisor to the president on these issues. They complex, uh, they advise on the most complex science and technology issues with the ocean being one of the areas under it. That is uh, current enough where recently the NSTC called the science advisors in from all of the agencies and asked them what the priorities are, what the actions ahead are, and um, they're putting out now where all of the committees and all of the sub interagency working groups are working on new work plans with deliverables and um, timelines and purposes, so this really helps get the, the impact and the deliverable out of the work and the message across. The final thing I would say is that with the SOS located in under NSTC, we work under the administration's right. guidance on budget, and you heard Darren talk to that. The interagency partnerships is one of the priority issues in the FY19 budget priority memo, as is um, innovation, as is uh, I had to make a list of them, sorry. Um, support innovative early stages research, maximize interagency coordination, develop future focused workforce, modernize and manage research infrastructure, and um, increase the government accountability and efficiency. I think what we do fits into a lot of those. I think um, before I talk too much longer, I'm gonna pass to Rick. Is it? Wow. <laughs> okay, I think this one's on. Um, I'd also like to thank everybody for being here and, bef um, and for inviting us to, to be up here. Um, I think I'd like to start, actually, Monty, with a comment about your socks. I see your socks are, are much nicer than any of ours up here. Um, so you really should have taken some credit for those. <laughs> 
Um, I'd like to start off with uh, a few follow-up points um, to what Lindy said. I'd also like to point out that there's a third co-chair of SOST who's unable to join us here um, today, and that's Cisco Werner, who many of you know from NOAA. He's the chief science advisor at NOAA Fisheries. And so, as Brad pointed out, I'm at NSF, um, Cisco's at NOAA, and um, Lindy is at OSTP and uh, from the Navy. And this is sort of one of my, my first points is uh, I've been doing this now for about four years, and um, I rapidly learned when I got here to Washington, D.C. that we all wear different hats. And you heard that from the people earlier, and they were talking about, what was Deren's wording? Um, Dual-hatted, and everybody was talking about when I'm wearing this hat and that hat. And for me, it sometimes comes down to something as straightforward as looking down at my badge and seeing who I'm representing today. And so right now I see Rick Murray, so that's a good start. And it's a subcommittee on ocean science and technology, which is why I'm, I'm here today. But I also represent NSF at various times as I'm you know, doing my thing around DC. And I think Lindy, who has started on here with SAUCE about a year ago now, you know, she's a really good example of doing a nice job. Um, she represents um, SAUCE as a co-chair, but she's also at OSTP reporting to Deeren, but she's also you know, from the Navy. And so we all have these dual hats, and we all put them on and take them off, but it's very important that we keep these roles separate. There's also a, a NSF representative who's looking out for NSF on SOS, um, whereas I, as along with the co-chairs, we're sort of doing our, our higher order thinking. And that's a very important point um, to get across. The other point I wanted to make, or one of two points I wanted, further points I wanted to make is, so okay, SOST, what is it? Um, and as Lindy pointed out, for example, um, IOOC that David Legler was just talking about, that's one of our IWGs. And I think SOST's real value, and this is the ultimate existential statement I realize, but I think SOST's real value is simply that we exist. We're there. And I think in a way, part of our success is that many people are not aware that we're there because to me that shows that we are not really a top-down organization. We're really a bottom-up. Far more people are aware of the IOOC or the Interagency Working Group on Ocean Acidification or the IWG on Facilities, which oversees all the research ships and everything like that. And that's actually the way it should be, right? Because those are the folks out doing all the interagency work and at the SOST level, we set up the, the high level relationship building and getting to know who the people are. And so there's that old adage, you should never be um, exchanging business cards um, during a crisis. And so the fact that the SOST uh, meets regularly and the IWGs meet regularly and we all oversee each other and work together wearing our different hats and our different badges at different times of different days. We're not exchanging business cards when an issue comes up. We pick up the phone, we know who to call, we exchange the information, and we do our business um, in, in that way. Um, so I think, you know, in that context, um, the fact that we exist, the fact that we know who each other are is, and I'm looking around the room here and I'm seeing you know, many, many people in that SOST family and that's one of the ways this place works. And it also works because there's long-standing commitments. I mean, Tom Drake mentioned that he's been at ONR for however long and uh, my old friend and colleague Reggie Beach for however long. Um, I've been in DC for three and a half years but I'm shortly soon to return to Boston University. There's a nice balance of continuity as well as um, rotation and people coming in and making you know, new contributions from um, you know, their, their new perspectives. In that way, the interagency aspect is very important, but that also enables us, ironically, to help on intra-agency relationships as well. Within NSF, the Division of Ocean Sciences, we're 43 people. NOAA, I heard, was 13,000. And I know there's the wet and the dry side and there's the this and the that, but it's a very fundamentally different organization. And 
and I say this with respect, not in any other way, but there are times I've noticed when we have some small working groups get together where several people come from NOAA and they're introducing themselves to each other because they might be in different sides of that agency and they might not have met each other yet because they're either newly hired or they've just been in, in different cylinders of excellence. <laughs> and so I think, you know, s it's interesting that SAUCE not only can help on the interagency introductions and relationship building, but also in the intra-agency as well. My third point is, is there was a lot of questions, either from industry or from, you know, specific sides about, you know, how do you work together? How do you identify what's important? Some of the strategies we've taken, and I, I thank Tom Drake for pointing out um, NSF's role in the, uh, in, the NOP, um, in the NOP realm. Some of the things that we look for is just as simply as identifying commonalities. And if you look at technology as a very good example of that, whether you're doing work that's classified or unclassified, or you're doing work in the shallow ocean or the deep ocean, or looking at atmosphere ocean exchange or sediment water exchange, whatever it might be, we all depend on technology. And technology is changing incredibly rapidly, but we all want to have, for example, better power utilization. We all want to have either smaller sensors that are more efficient sensors measuring the same old thing we've been measuring for you know 60 years but you can do it better or new sensors such as soft body sensors that they can measure new things in new locations and so that's one of the approaches we take at SOST as a, as a very simple strategic approach it's like okay we're hearing this from BOEM we're hearing this from NSF we're hearing this from um, you know, the, the academic geeks were hearing this from, you know, the more applied side of things, whatever it might be. What are those commonalities? And that is, a, I think, a key role that SAUCE can play simply by listening and simply by um, existing, okay? And then my only other point we can perhaps explore in during question and answer is we do, just because we all know each other, play a big role in international conversations as well. Um, you know, David Legler from NOAA, who's at IOOC, who you just saw, he works with us on, you know, a number of G7 type conversations and those sorts of matters. It's often the same people. And whether we know each other through SOST or through an IWG or through a task force or through a whatever, it's the same people. It's the coalition of, not the apathetic, but the coalition of, you know, the people that will roll up their sleeves and say yes, doing the duties as, other duties as, as described. And I'll stop at that point, Dr. Moran. Thank you, Rick, and thank you, Lindy. I, uh, I think that's an excellent overview of what the SOST is, uh, how it functions, the various moving parts. And so uh, why don't we dive a little more deeply and, uh, and kick off this, um, this sort of Q&A, and then we'll get to the audience. But just, just to start out, if you, either one, uh, comment on um, a success story. In other words, where, if you had to, to point to one success of interagency partnerships through SOST or other means, um, if you could talk about that in terms of what made it successful, what are the lessons learned, and how this might carry forward to actually your successors going forward. Sure, I'll, I'll talk about two. I'll, I'll try to be quick. Um, one of them also speaks to that point I said about our importance being just that we exist. And I'll tell a little story that I was in a building very, very close to here uh, a number of years ago, and well, three years ago, and uh, talking with uh, someone who frankly probably should have known better, and we were, we were talking about ships. And this person said to me, I was wearing my NSF badge at the time, said, um, you know, uh, you NSFers, uh, yeah, I understand you've got your, your research ships and so on, but, but you should really go talk to those UNALS folks because they really have their <laughs> ships all figured out. Now, you know, for tho those of you that are aware, you know, we oversee UNALS and, and we fund that along with our dear colleagues at ONR and other agencies, um, and NOAA contributes as well to, to that. And so that was kind of like, okay, that, that's, a, that's good. Um, they don't know we're there because, again, like I said earlier, the work is getting done and, and that's the way it should be. So that is a good example, I think, of, of a, so, you know, UNALS is not specifically underneath 
um, sauced by any way, shape, or form, but it's the same agencies, it's the same people doing the same thing um, in terms of developing these partnerships. You know, inside UNALS, there's, there's NSF-owned vessels, there's vessels owned by academic institutions, there's vessels owned by ONR, they all work together, et cetera, et cetera. And that's probably one of the most successful partnerships in ocean history. And people don't know actually who runs it or oversees it or whatever. And I'm kind of cool with that, although at times it does make for some challenging arguments when we're in budgetary world. Um, the second thing, I'll just pick up on something that Tom Drake was mentioning in the context with Reggie Beach and some of the work we've been doing in the sense of the NOP uh, recent BAA uh, broad agency announcement about censors. Um, uh, we did sit down and we said, you know, you pay, uh, you, you play, you pay. And uh, we got that together in the space of about a year and a half. And, uh, excuse me, year and a half. And, um, <coughs> yeah, I'm going back to Boston. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, $18 million out there for, for CubeSats, ocean sensors, and some other things. And, again, it's a, in that case, it was a, a coalition not only of the willing, but a coalition of making sure we had people in the room that can... Um, Reggie and I asked the, the people to be in the room to really be those that have financial decision-making ability. They need to inform their boss, but they don't need to ask their boss's permission, per se, other than the, the usual. So it's like, get the right people in the right room. You can make a decision. We pass the hat. Um, ONR certainly has the uh, greater financial contribution to that than does NSF, but you know we're, we're putting in several millions of dollars to that. Um, from our um, flat budget, and I think that's really already made uh, or is in the process of making a big difference to the community um, in that regard. Um, I figured out how to get it on. <laughs> um, so a couple things. One is the SOST itself. I think uh, one of the things that the, the Subcommittee on Ocean Science and Technology does is gets together. They did a 10-year plan uh, previously from 7 to 17 and there's a new one working and the success of that is the the ability to prioritize some direction to go um, slowly once that's out but it's working and it's been a lot of dialogue to get that forward and I see that as a success um, the success of just the people being in the room and knowing who uh, Dr. Drake can probably add to this but the the Navy has been getting researchers and operators together uh, in um, an ocean observation system uh, uh, security group, really with the proliferation of civilian um, observation and the, the concerns over looking at what, if any, concerns there are national security-wise, to identify that and then have the right people to go and talk to to solve um, any kind of observation re data release early is a good thing. Um, so I think that's a success story of knowing the right people, and a lot of that comes just from the agencies having their own relationships, but it's facilitated and fostered in the SOST and some of these other working groups. Two others, um, just from my own Navy side of things knowing, one is the ability to know and the ability to have the, the forum for the dialogue on, on wind energy, oil and gas fields and so forth, to find out from the Navy early or for the Navy to find out from industry or whatever what's going to be happening. That dialogue is, is really good. Um, and the third thing is, even if you can have dialogue on um, where you're going to hear about aquaculture later, uh, some of these dialogues are facilitated through finding out where somebody wants to put an aquaculture farm or a fish farm or anything um, and working that with state or federal waters and having the various federal agencies. The Navy has some areas kind of off limits to other people and sometimes that can work. So the dialogue early is really good and I think we help by everybody knowing each other, knowing what's going on out there and sharing it and encouraging and facilitating early dialogue to avoid later obstacles. Thank you so much for that. I, um, I'm going to pick up on a thread actually, uh, I think from Rick on UNALS and uh, many of us in the room are academics. I'm an academic. You're on loan as an academic, Rick. Um, I, I wanted to hear your perspective on, uh, as SOS co-chairs, of some of the things that um, the federal agencies could do to really advance the partnerships with academia, and if, and if you can, a comment also with industry. 
And I'd actually like to also point out that um, you're probably burning out there with questions. So there are two mics in the room. I encourage you to uh, engage with this panel. We've got another 40, 40 minutes or so. So uh, I'll turn it to our panelists right now. Um, I'll start on that one because uh, um, not so much necessarily just through SOST, but OSTP is holding um, its first federal interagency STEM workshop today. Uh, and they have um, a fairly large number of things that they're working on. One of them is to expand public-private partnerships in educational entities and employers. Um, a lot more work-based learning, including pre-apprenticeships, apprenticeships, internships, job shadows, uh, expanding industry-recognized credentialing for STEM programs, teachers in industry, school business collaborations, pathways. Um, it's pretty active. Uh, I know that Task Force Ocean actually had a HR section working under it, and I haven't told Rick this, but I'm kind of hoping that once they formalize things, maybe we can take Task Force Ocean and make it, broaden it across the agency with a good starting point there, and even with what work they've done in STEM there. But STEM on the bigger picture is a lot of this participation with getting, Navy-wise, um, more m people on ships into the STEM world, more people in academics, be the teachers or the students, out onto the ships to see the real time what they're trying to do. That's where the innovation and the ideas can really come from in a lot of times. And that's happening across other areas. Uh, the other thing is maybe with various grant and challenge programs. I know this administration with grant programs is trying to uh, streamline, because sometimes grant programs are difficult, and maybe to streamline the time and the energy that goes into those to get more time to actually do the work. From the academic side, in terms of uh, how to get academics more involved and just better informed about things. Um, several of the agencies uh, have more involvement with academics than others. Clearly, NSF has a ton of involvement with academics. Uh, ONR does as well, and certain other agencies, uh, NOAA, of course, but certain other agencies to varying degrees, usually smaller. But I think uh, it's just very important to um, again, have rotators, people come in um, from the outside like myself um, uh, because then we can then be points of contact for the academic community. I know on my own personal side of things, I was aware that SOST existed um, purely because I had mentors and friends who had been in D.C. Um, earlier than I, including Brad, who um, when Brad was at NSF and then he spent one year at OSTP doing li what Lindy is doing right now and was a co-chair of SOST and I've known Brad for more years than we will either admit in public um, but uh, you know in talking to Brad he was you know kind of opened my eyes to all this sort of stuff and, and helped educate me so when I came in here I was reasonably well informed and you know so academics can reach out at, at, at NSF we have this old saying that we tell everybody, they always come to us, you know, how can I get more money out of you? And say, well, first of all, contact your program officers. Call your program officers. Call your program officers. When you're done with that, call your program officers. And, you know, people need to call up Brad. Call me up when we're out there. Call up Rob Dunbar, who's very familiar here from Stanford. He's very familiar with how government works. And all you people here in the audience from, um, you know, COL, COL is the Consortium for Ocean Leadership with a bunch of academics and a bunch of other non-academics use these people as their contacts to find out. So they'll call me up and say, hey, what's going on with ocean acidification? Now, NSF doesn't have a huge footprint right now in ocean acidification, but we certainly have a lot going, enough going on, and, and I know where to steer people to. So I think, again, there's a, a very important communications pathway as well as a managing community expectations pathway and role that we can play. I have one little add to that um, in that I think it's a growing, this ties in some congressional authorities, uh, at least to the services, the, there's now congressional authority to take different services, have different names for it, but it's sort of a, t a time out program to go and do up to two years somewhere else and they've, they've been working on how to not affect your career track on that, but it's to get military people, and you could do this from other agencies probably, out into agencies and, I mean, uh, industry, and really have a lot more cross-pollination. 
Um, and the whole new retirement system from the military is going to encourage some of that. But I think that the, the cross-pollination of the in and out time is a really good opportunity that's slowly building. So you could do it with industry just like academia in some ways. Yeah, thanks very much. Actually, since you, you've dragged me into this, just one moment, Ari. I'm going <laughs> uh, I, I, to I'm dying to ask this question. I mean it in all sincerity. And actually, it's teeing off what uh, uh, Darren had said earlier. You've got right now an EO for the National Ocean Council and Policy. That was the prior administration's move, right? We all know that. And the SAUCE has given the S&T on ocean guidance. So one challenge that I, when I was there, since you mentioned it, <laughs> I'm wondering what your, you know, how is it now, effectively, when the 27 agencies in that Ocean Council have a budget of their own and a mission or a mandate of their own, and yet there are milestones and goals to make it happen with the ocean policy. So I'm just, you know, that's a tricky balance, right? And and a lot of moving parts. So by the way, I, I, I share, you know, <laughs> your pain, your sympathy, that's a lot of work. But uh, sort of where are we at with the reality of a certain amount of money and a mission agency, say no, or O&R, or basic research, NSF, and that balance in making the EO, the Ocean Council, move forward? Care to comment on that? I'll start off with just one or two sentences, and then I'll hand it over to Lindy, who may or may not hand it over to Darren, who may or may not hand it over to somebody else. Um, but just as a reminder, SOST is not a funding interagency body. We do not tell agencies what to do because they have their own missions, either as, as mission statements or as congressional mandates or, or what have you. We promote agency cohesion and collaboration and in a way, it's kind of nice because we don't have the pressures of directly allocating funds. So, you know, Lindy, myself, and, and Cisco, we're, we're the co-chairs, um, you know, but you can't come up to us and say, gee, why don't you put more money into X, Y, or Z? And that's kind of liberating. They, and they know we're, we're um, useless for that. Um, and um, so I often will put my sauce hat on because I also get the same questions wearing my NSF hat. But I will say it's very nice in sauce land to not have that funding pressure. We can just speak to the coordination aspects. Now, regarding NOC and, and NOP, I'll pass that over to you or question and answer session or, or however you guys want to do it. Um, I will let Darren talk about NOC, but I will say that the SOST has a dual role, and one of its role is the science and technology arm under the National Ocean Council, which was uh, is to stand up and implement the um, the implementing uh, ocean policy. Sorry, um, <laughs> uh, and there's also a resor ocean resource management subcommittee as well as SOST under the NOC. So the NOC, in some ways, pulls that together. Um, the NOC also doesn't have any necessary funding. And both of them have a voice up through. The NOC also crosses over with the Council for Environmental Quality, so has another angle in there, um, and pulls various agency uh, senior leadership together. They all agreed to participate in this, so it brings it up another level. SOST has, um, is a committee working on the science itself, and the NOC is sort of pulling these leaderships, uh, uh, leaders, agency leadership up into the decision um, prioritization. You want to add to that? Great. Thank you. Um, just very briefly, Brad. Um, so one of the things that we're thinking about as we look at the policy going forward is, is there is there an opportunity or a need for the council to um, recognizing the, 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 the multiplicity of of priority documents that are out there that identify whether that's cross-government, whether that's regional, whether it's within an agency. I mean, there are all sorts of, you know, identifications of what's important, what do we need to spend money on, how do we focus that. Thinking cross-government and looking at challenging resources, is there an opportunity or need and a benefit to having the council without getting in the way of those or, or it, you know, stepping on those kind of priorities, providing a signal 
in the form of identified priorities that have the consensus of, right, and sort of trying to drive towards what is a high level of, of a few number of priorities that we can all agree deserve some sort of investment on a collaborative way. The second piece of it then is there was a lot of discussion about the National Oceanographic Partnership Program. Uh, and we see that as a strong and positive and, and underutilized mechanism by which we have the opportunity to do which, that which is challenging in many instances, which is to commingle money from a number of agencies. It also has the benefit of being able to bring in the private sector and the research community to work collaboratively and through that synergy get more throw weight for the dollars invested. So if you connect those two things, so high level signal, smaller number of priorities, consensus across the board, and then the ability to plug that in perhaps to the NOPP going forward, then you start to be able to address the issue that you're describing. Thanks. And I think all of your comments are really helpful to the audience to sort of get in mind what SOST is, how it functions and benefits the ocean science community. We have a question over here. From, just please state your name and Thanks. ask a question. Thanks, Brad. Uh, Ari Gerstmann with the University Corporation for Atmospheric Research. Um, I want to interrupt this important conversation about OSTP's unique but limited role and go back to your question about the role of the academic community. And uh, Rick, your, your answer, I, I'm sure you implied it, but I'm hoping you could talk a little bit more explicitly about the two-way communication between the government and the academic community. I know that in the atmospheric side, we see a lot of opportunity for academics to inform government partners about ways that they can do a better job of collaborating across agencies. Um, and even within agencies, and, and Rick, you know this in, in the work that NCAR does, uh, at, within GEO, we've done a, a lot to uh, encourage uh, AGS and OCE to work together, particularly in community modeling. And, uh, and we see sometimes that academics can stand up and say, wait a second, I'm seeing a call for research that's remarkably similar to a call that another agency just let out a month ago. Do these program managers know each other? Do these program managers know that they're asking for similar research? And sometimes we, we see opportunities where um, a single PI who is receiving funding from uh, uh, two different agencies to study a, a, a similar problem uh, can themselves be the point at which uh, interagency collaboration can exist. And, and they can drive it from outside the beltway which is even better, right? So uh, I'm, I'm wondering if, if there are uh, examples like that in the ocean community that you guys can put point to and, and really just to encourage the academics in the room to say that there's a really important role that they can play in interagency collaboration. Yeah, you, you said that really, really well, Ari. And, and to that, I would add there's a fractal dimensionality to it. You can have individual PIs working through the different program officers. And I see this commonly um, between NSF and ONR in the realm of physical oceanography. There's some very close ties between those two agencies at the program officer level because they're talking to the same PIs. And then if you move up a fractal dimension and then you start getting into, say, um, individual universities. So the, the Brad Moran, the the Monty Grahams of the world who are, are leaders of their academic institutions, they're seeing what their populations are pursuing in the, for the funding, and they can identify those and inform us. You go up another fractal dimension and you get to the, the UCARs and the COLs who can do that at a, at a larger scale, and then one more, the AGUs, the, uh, the TOSs, and, and so on and so forth. So you're absolutely right that the um, um, role of the community uh, is in both directions. And also, it's incumbent, and I sort of want to, NSF here, want to thank the leaders of the community at their different levels for helping us manage community expectations as well. So there's a, there's a request side of this that kind of bubbles up. But there's also a managing side of this where we can say certain things to the academic leaders and then that percolates downward. Percolates always goes up. So why do people say percolate down? But um, popcorn kernel down um, the way to the, uh, to the PIs. All right. Uh, 
our Admiral White said to shake things up, and we uh, need to hear an industry perspective. So this fellow over here, Professor Marlon Lewis, is going to shake things up and give a question. I hope this speaks a little bit to that. Well, sort of. <laughs> Thank you, Brad. Um, there, I'd like to circle back to a point that was raised in the previous panel, and I'd like to do it, uh, well, specifically with the reference to Admiral White's tie, if I could, please. Um, and for those of you that weren't here this morning, he, in his very nice opening, he referred to his tie, which depicts a sextant, an astrolabe, and a star chart on it as a good example of how to navigate for the future. And I just wanted to point out that the sextant was invented by a Scottish-British uh, military officer at the end of the 1700s, kind of a funny time when the United States was being formed. The astrolabe is a product of the Islamic culture, and most of the stars on his star chart, is, as a celestial navigator will know, are in Arabic. So I can look at this, and probably if you turned the tie over, you'd find it was made in Vietnam. So you could look at it <laughs> sort of as a, as a product of a <laughs> subversive series of, a subversive product of a series of you know, the United States' past and present enemies there. But the other way to look at it is that, um, the, it's a good example of the power of international partnerships in driving forward productive ways to navigate the future. And that's, that's the point that I'd like to make here. We live in a time that has never been better with respect to the um, international communities embracing of the ocean world there. The, uh, it's an auspicious time. The UN has held their first ever oceans conference last year in New York. The UN has appointed a special ocean envoy in Peter Thompson there, who now has an associated with Woods Hole Oceanographic as well. This year, uh, Canada is the host of the G7 uh, uh, summit here, and as a host nation there, we're able to choose the uh, themes of it, and oceans is one of the themes of this year's G7. So I think it's a uh, wonderful time to embrace an international partnership there, and I guess if I were to turn this into a question for the uh, panel here is, do you think that the United States has an effective way at present of rolling up the priorities of the oceanographic community in a way that would drive forward productive ocean partnerships in the future. John Holden took a personal interest, Brad, as you remember this and, and advancing this. I don't see that right now. Um, do you think that it's currently being effectively um, brought forward to the international community to, uh, in, a, in a way that's going to be good for the community in the United States? Thank you. Thanks, Marlon. I can say a little bit, but probably not a detail. I, um, as I think I heard mentioned earlier, there is a pretty robust community of people doing this, and um, actually the SOST is looking at implementing the UN plan that's come before them, and this is the decade of the ocean under the UN, I believe. Um, so there are efforts going on. Um, I'm not working them personally where I would be comfortable talking in detail about it. Um, and I don't know if you have anything to add to that. So to answer your question specifically, I'd say no. I'd say it's not effective yet. I think there have been times in the past where it's been more effective. I think we're coming out of a relatively less effective time, perhaps. Um, but I see progress, and I and you know we all base our experiences on what we see, you know, right in front of us and work on every day. I just want to draw attention again to another fractal dimensionality thing. Uh, Jesse McGrath in the back row there. Jesse, wave your hand if you wouldn't mind. Um, so Jesse, she's um, she works in my division. Reports to me, she's our ocean policy specialist. Uh, Roxanne Nicholas, many of you know, may know, she used to have that position. She's also our one of our SOST policy advisors. Next to Jeanette Davis, there. Raise your, raise your hand. There you go. Um, but she's also the U.S. government's point of contact for G7. So she works very, very closely with uh, Allison at the State Department and all these sorts of things. So you know, we talk about wearing many different hats. So there are some structural things we have in place. I know NSF, we uh, have a barter agreement with the UK in terms of ship access, and we're actually a little bit in arrears to them in terms of daytime back and forth. So there's some tentative stuff. Is it effective? I don't think it's effective at a, at a wholesale scale yet, but where there's a will, there's a way, and there's some other aspects, you know, the Galway Agreement and some of these other things that I think are, are on the way. Um, I wouldn't say it's like a, a real effective part of what we do and it's seamless and transparent and 
transformational and all these other things that we like to pass around. Um, but boy, you're absolutely right. It's a global world. It's a global ocean. It's one ocean, all those sorts of things. But we need to do better in that. I'll just add a little bit to that. Um, that's a great question, Marlon. And um, you know, one of the coolest things for this kid from Northern Ontario was actually uh, going to the uh, first Our Oceans Conference in the State Department and, and driving in the car back with John Holder near the West Wing. I mean, that was pretty wild. Um, so anyways, that's a digression. But he made a comment, and uh, or someone made a comment, I should say, that I found there was a tension. There was no real discussion in National Ocean Council at that State Department first Secretary Kerry's first Our Oceans Conference, it was quite noticeable. You had a lot of marine protected area and very wealthy people and countries um, supporting that, but um, I think that's a real opportunity for interagency uh, collaboration on the international front. I'm going to make one plug, though, um, since it's nice to have takeaways from these meetings, and one takeaway, and you teed it up really nicely, is this new program. It's like an Arctic UNOLS program run out of the European Union. Anywhere, in, anybody in this room can apply at the end of this month to get ship time on German, Sweden, British, Canada, Yamanson, um, vessels, and Germany um, by simply applying for that. And that, that was funded by the EU. So Kuliak is the only U.S. partner in that program. And, you know, that's an amazing opportunity uh, to leverage your uh, research in the Arctic waters. Again, that's led by the EU, but U the U.S. is part of that. And that's the kind of thing that would really be um, a great way to leverage our capacity. Um, I'm not gonna, not gonna hog the mic anymore. Do you have anything to add to that? Sorry. You, sir. Thank you, my name is Steve Thur. I work for NOAA's National Ocean Service. I also happen to be one of the IWG co-chairs for HAB and Hypoxia. Um, so to address a, a comment that was made earlier, one of the benefits of the IWG structure is the internal communications that are occurring so that we hopefully understand FFOs and grant processes and we're making each other aware. And I think that's been very effective, at least in the IWG that I participate in. What we are struggling with, and what I haven't heard either of the panels address yet, are the risks associated with partnerships, specifically the risks that the interdependencies create. So if we each bring our Lincoln logs and we build a nice little log cabin together and priorities of a single player change or a budget initiative occurs, pulling one or two of those logs out causes the house to fall. We're not effectively analyzing the risks associated with the partnerships and developing mitigation strategies for those kinds of events. We're leaving it to chance. Your reactions. I, I, I think I can address that in part um, in that I think falling as an IWG in under the SOST, which has the federal agency discussion, helps that because OMB is in those dialogues um, and they participate. And so getting the message from the agency that it's supported across the inter, um, interagency working group and pushing that upward so that it becomes an administration priority, I think will help. Um, and the work plans that are approved up through NSTC are supported by the administration. And I mean, they're looking for very specific work plans with timelines and, and ways ahead that, they, that will be bought off on. I don't know if that's answering things that are falling through, but hopefully it's avoiding things going forward that cause that. That's a similar problem with public-private, which they'll probably talk about this afternoon. You've got risks of once you get to an authority, once you actually get your authority and then get your funding, you know, if something falls through, it's the same sort of thing. But I think that getting the interagency working groups up through the NSTC organization, which has the administration signing off on those work plans and projects, should benefit that. If I could just chime in, that's a great point you made. And we see it at different positions throughout all our funding agencies, um, you know, most certainly. I turn it around a little bit as well, and um, it's a standard dogma to say, well, we really need to reduce redundancies and uh, thereby become more efficient and, you know, better return on investment and all these sorts of things. I, I support that, of course. We don't want 100 percent duplication um, throughout the whole world, but on the other hand, Sometimes duplication is a good thing, and sometimes redundancy is a good thing if it's, you know, two different eyes looking at the same problem. So maybe a, a one aspect of NOAA looking at one aspect of the problem and another side of NOAA or another agency or, or whatever. Sometimes, you know, a fair bit of redundancy can, in fact, help mitigate that. And uh, it's kind of like, you know, a team sports analogy. You know, hockey team has uh, six defensemen. And, uh, you know, and they're, 
you know, you need every single one of them. And they all play defense and they're all playing on the same team. And if you look at the USG overall as being one big old team, uh, sometimes a little redundancy is not a bad thing. Certainly the pendulum can swing too far and you have you know, way too much redundancy and I think we can probably identify some of those. But I, I maintain my, my thesis here of redundancy by definition is not bad because it can mitigate um, that point you made. Next question from Frank. Hi, Frank Schwing at NOAA Fisheries. And uh, we can all point to some really successful public-private partnership success stories, but they often to be in one dimension. We work with fish industry and fisheries, for example, or BOEM with the energy industry. NSF, the academics, uh, we have partnerships with NGOs. But how are we, in your fractal example, taking that to the next step and making sure that we're not creating cylinders of partnerships but truly bringing all those groups to the table. And I'll point out to a, a really great example what Marlin's doing in Nova Scotia where he has a really nice consortium of academic industry and government working together. So do we have some examples where we're doing that at the multidimensional perspective uh, federal or, or what are we doing to advance that? I could give one, this borders on an anecdote and I usually don't like anecdotes because then they get right into anec data and it doesn't really help. But here's a specific example, and I mention it because it's pretty high profile, at least in the NSF world. We have the Ocean Observatories Initiative, which costs us $385 million to build, and it's online now, and uh, we're hopefully operating it in the future at about $45 million a year. And there's several different components around um, East Coast, West Coast, North Atlantic, and the North Pacific right now. Well, one of these arrays is called the Pioneer Array, and it's located off essentially south of Martha's Vineyard in Long Island and so on. And those scientists there, in particular a, a gentleman named Glenn Gawarkowitz at, at Woods Hall, um, he works really, really closely with the fishing community um, uh, in terms of data generation. So there's some fishermen going out and taking some profiles on their ships. The fishing community has actually given Glenn some very confidential you know, location of their hot spots that they, you know, commercial fishermen will cherish their keeping that private. Um, but there's a very nice dynamic between that group at Woods Hole using that pioneer data and the commercial fishing industry. And that was, in fact, some of the target, some of the reason that we, we built the thing. Um, but it's flourishing to a level that we did not anticipate whatsoever. It's getting to the point where the commercial fishing industry is some of our strongest co communicators in terms of the merits of the, uh, the OOI. Um, and so I think that's a, that's a good concrete example. I mean, I never thought I'd see the day where there'd be town halls where you've got, you know, the federal scientists and the commercial fishing community standing together as opposed to an adversarial relationship um, really working together and, and arguing in favor. Part of that is also because the OOI data is public and streaming and available to all. You can be a scientist in Kansas, not that there's anything wrong with Kansas, but you can be an oceanographer in Kansas and downloading that data. You can be a commercial fisherman in Rhode Island and be downloading that data to help you figure out where to go um, you know, that day. So I think it, like I say, kind of borders on an anecdote, but it's a pretty large scale anecdote and I think you're gonna see more and more of that. And there's probably others in the audience Dave or others that might have other things. Jesse, you have? No? I, I think um, echoing what Deeran might say if he was sitting here, that the um, portals for the data may be well doing this in that you're having industry and state and local governments, federal and so forth, input into the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic portals and they're proving to be, um, from everybody that's coming back to us, enormously valuable and they're actually funded from outside right now a lot. We're trying to find ways to help fund them to mix it. But to me, those would be a good example of where it's all coming together and going to have, hopefully, some sustainability that way. That's great. And we'll take, I, we've got five more minutes to go, and we'll take another question. I keep waiting for Rick to say partnerships, but I, I don't know if it's going to happen. Anyways, over here, please. Hi, this is just a quick last question. Uh, I'm Rachel Keelan, and I'm with the National Ocean Service at NOAA. I am wondering, with the announcement on February 6th by the White House about a reorg of the NSTC, how you envision SOST falling out? 
That's a good question. <laughs> And it's happening, so I have to make sure not to get ahead of anybody or anything. SOST is, uh, is a very strong, one of the, SOST is one of the strongest subcommittees. It will continue to exist. What's being added, um, it, they found when they really looked at it that they had something like 90 subcommittees and so forth. And the position right now is we've got to pick our priorities because if everything's a priority, nothing's going to get done. So there's been some streamlining and a lot of ways to narrow down. SOST will continue to do what it's doing. We are working, all of the um, IWGs and the, sub and the subcommittee will be working work plans and charters to be approved, hopefully by the 21st of April. I don't know if everybody knows that, but. Um, now we do. <laughs> <laughs> but there's, interestingly, there's a new committee, and I was authorized to say this today, that the, where they're combining science and technology for so many things that go across the board that are so hard to actually get forward because they, they play into too many different silos or cylinders. Um, and this will pull some things together and really pull that technology and the science into one place and get it further. We may have some things that fall up into, the, into or with or into that, but um, as of now, SOST is as it is. Okay. Wow. Ouch on that one. That was a great question. Um, April 21st, you heard it here. Uh, I want to thank our, uh, our panel and please uh, join me in doing so. Thank you very much.